Thank you, Kai. First of all, uh, I want to thank you for the invitation. I think uh, this is really a very nice place here in Heidelberg. I was, uh, when I traveled here by uh, the car, uh, going up these mountains, passing the castle, a uh, very romantic uh, environment. So thanks a lot and uh, congratulations. I also would prefer to work in a place like this, uh, to be quite honestly. Uh, and today I want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, future compute paradigms. This is uh, what I call the presentation. Um, I want to give some insights pretty much on uh, what the IBM Research and Development Organization uh, has in mind for the future. I think um, right at the moment uh, we are in the happy situation uh, that we can produce uh, uh, quite a big amount of compute power, but nevertheless I think there are still problems in this world which uh, can be solved even with this um, massive compute power we have in place right at the moment. Uh, the presentation I give today is uh, mainly pulled out of the complete research and development organization. I just want to briefly introduce that to you and uh, also show a little bit uh, pretty much where the main contributions are done today. Uh, the research, we will talk a little bit about semiconductor um, physics, we will talk a little bit about artificial intelligence, we will talk a little bit about quantum computing. And uh, the places where this is done is uh, mainly uh, in Yorktown, actually, this is on the uh, east coast uh, of the U.S. Then uh, we have uh, Almaden, which is uh, down there uh, in California. Uh, we have the research lab uh, in Zurich, which is uh, the biggest research lab, actually, of IBM here in, in Europe, and um, we work very closely. And then I myself, I come from Böblingen. Böblingen is a huge development lab. This, is, this means we are more focused on... Um, Product development, actually, uh, the research teams are more focused on fun fundamentals, actually. But in my job, actually, luckily, I'm not so much uh, anymore involved uh, with the pure operation. My job is it to translate the basics from research into our products. And uh, for that reason, it's important for me to watch a little bit what's happening there. And uh, what's happening there, I, I want to introduce to you today. So when we talk about uh, f future compute paradigms, I think, uh, first of all, uh, I want to start a little bit uh, with uh, the most popular um, implementations we know and um, uh, look at that a little bit historical. Um, and um, pretty much what we see is that um, way back, uh, some guys, I think today we would call them nerds, uh, actually came, had some uh, crazy ideas like uh, writing numbers in a new notation like Leibniz did uh, and uh, pretty much invented binary. And then uh, we had Boole uh, who came up with uh, some basic logic uh, ideas and then we had guys like De Morgan uh, who uh, defined the kind of algebra. Uh, and uh, I think uh, from a theoretical point of view uh, at that time, I think maybe it's a spectacular. Today it's, uh, well, everyone uh, get, is teached in school actually what this is. Um, but nevertheless, I think for the time they invented that, it was a, a step forward. And um, in essence, this more or less is uh, the theoretical base for all the computing we do today. Um, but the little thing, of course, we need uh, is we need some devices, some physically implemented devices actually, which are capable to use this theory uh, in an efficient way. And pretty much what we see here is a little bit difficult to see for sure. This is the first field effect transistor uh, as it was invented by Schottky uh, way back in the last century. Uh, he also got a Nobel Prize for that. And um, when we put these two things together actually, um, then we got more or less uh, all the things we saw within the last 50 to 60 years uh, what we described with Moore's law, with Denard law and with Amdahl's law. That's, uh, these are, uh, so to speak, the fundamentals. Um, now, what's the nice thing about this uh, field effect transistor? Um, one thing is, of course, uh, it was certainly a big insight at that point uh, from a semiconductor perspective, but the important part is uh, that this is a technology which is perfectly scaling, which can be clocked in a very uh, uh, fast way. Um, and uh, at the same time then, of course, as we combine it with uh, compute architecture, we can also paralyze tasks uh, in a very sophisticated way. And um, 
Pretty much uh, these uh, three items I just called, uh, they are reflected on the laws which describe all this computing right at the moment. We talk about Moore's law, when we talk about scaling, we talk about Dennard's law actually when we talk about power consumption, and we talk about Amdahl's law actually when we talk about parallelization. And uh, certainly the most uh, well known of that is um, Moore's law and everyone is talking about Moore's law is dead, um, to be quite frankly. I think Moore's law is the one which is most alive, while Dennard's law actually and Amdahl's law is really dead, okay? And uh, why this is, uh, I want to go a little bit into detail right at the moment. What All of these are empiric laws, okay? So these are pretty much uh, things which had been formulated uh, empirically, but what Moore said is we can scale that down uh, to extremely small transistors actually and uh, we got a extremely high density on the chip and when we look uh, at the roadmap, our development roadmap right at the moment, we see that even though we are pretty far down at 10 nanometer um, structures right at the moment in uh, semiconductors, we still uh, made a big step forward now with the new lithography actually which is called extreme ultraviolet um, and which, is al which allows us to go really far beyond the 10 nanometer to 7 nanometer technologies and to 5 nanometer technologies. This means right at the moment uh, our high-end chips they host something like 8 billion transistors on the size of a post stamp more or less but what we will see in the future will be numbers of 10 million or so. Okay, this is really realistic and this means Moore's statement continues at least till we get into this range of 5 nanometer. I mean beyond that um, we all know Abbe's law actually and resolution and all this it certainly will get difficult but um, I think for the next 5 to 10 years we will see a further scaling in the semiconductor industry. What we have to keep in mind um, there are new approaches needed actually in order to leverage the scaling. Uh, the problem we see is that on these uh, small chips, uh, of course we get less and less yield. This means um, if you want to have a really all parts good chip right at the moment, the yield is in the range, uh, range of something like 20% or so. And uh, from a profitability perspective, this of course is a difficult situation to handle. From that perspective, the trend um, also goes into kind of first level packaging methodologies. This means we build smaller dies actually and combine them in a kind of silicon package uh, so that um, the uh, one socket system still hosts a lot of transistors but is uh, not so big in die size. And this uh, can raise actually our yield um, quite dramatically because smaller chips of course um, are easier to handle in the production process. Okay. But that's uh, more or less uh, the idea towards Moore's law. This means uh, we will, see, we will uh, scale down a little bit further and Moore's law in a certain sense will stay alive. Now uh, I have already um, done some hints here. We see within these structures that we use different gate oxide technologies like FinFETs and nanosheets. And this is really what brings us to um, Dennard's law. I think Dennard's law is an important one because what Dennard said is as we scale down the size of these transistors actually the power consumption of each uh, transistor will also scale with the size. Okay? This means as we had um, a step from 1 billion to 2 billion transistors actually the power consumption actually was more or less the same over many many years and um, when we look 10 years back this could be used in order to raise the process of frequency dramatically. And when we talk about Moore's law, of course we, we talk about this uh, huge performance gain we have seen over 10 years and t uh, in the early years the most of the performance gain actually uh, what, what you got was through frequency, not only through transistor scaling. And what we see here is why Dennard's law actually after two or three decades actually where it worked, uh, got into a problematic uh, phase and uh, this is for the following reason. What we see here is the gate oxide of a, a field effect transistor. We see the silicium dots here, actually these are silicium atoms. Uh, we can uh, pretty much do the image uh, by uh, atomic force uh, microscope which was invented in Zurich by the way uh, and got a Nobel Prize. Then you see the silicium dioxide actually. Um, 
which is a, a kind of amorph structure, and you got polysilicium, which is the contact material. Okay? And in order to allow these extremely high frequencies, we run in these processes right at the moment, we run around 4 to 5 gigahertz, at least for our processors. I think 3.5 gigahertz is a um, value which is uh, more or less common used, uh, commonly used uh, at the moment by Intel or AMD, but nevertheless we are somewhere in the some gigahertz range. And uh, in order to reach this, um, you have to pretty much minimize this layer here, because the field effect of course means your electrical field has to uh, be uh, penetrating this, this uh, layer. And this, the thinner this layer is actually the higher your frequency um, is uh, doable. Uh, at the moment you can see that here we are at 2.6 nanometer, 2.2 nanometer. Uh, one uh, requirement in the production process is to keep this kind of uh, homogeneous. This means the range between uh, this is varying, uh, uh, is not allowed to be too big because we have a capa uh, capacitance actually which is depending on that. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, even so we have just small voltages between the polysilicium and the silicium, uh, which is in the range of 0.5 volt. Um, this still has to isolate these two layers from one another. And even so, we are down to 0.5 volt, right at the moment when we run thicknesses of the gate oxide uh, in that thickness, the leakage is in the range of 50%. And each nanometer, you drop that, actually your leakage is getting worse and worse, and this means we are at a kind of break-even uh, where we can scale that down. And uh, what you see in the last 10 years, we did not get any frequency gain. Uh, the only thing we got actually was multi-core and other parallelization, which then is described by Amdahl. Okay? So Dennard, uh, 10 years ago, more or less, um, prevented us uh, from making further progress. I mean, there was even so um, still invention required. Uh, what we do now is so-called, we, we just saw a planner, structure, what we do now is more 3D structures. Uh, what you see here is this FinFET technology. This means you do so-called uh, gate all around technology. So you can pretty much uh, improve the power consumption a little bit by using these fins uh, with a fin height and the fin pitch actually and then having the poly uh, silicium um, coated around that. With that you can lower the consumption a little bit because your field effect is more efficient in a 3D structure. And the latest which will come then uh, with the next uh, generations is our so-called nanosheets. Um, and nanosheets are a typical 3D structure actually to mitigate the gate oxide situation. There you have little uh, sheet pitches actually and uh, uh, they more or less uh, represent the gate oxide then from the planar structure. And with that we can save uh, some of the power which we would lose when we should go just with uh, planar structures, but nevertheless I think Daniel's law is really at an end and I do not expect that uh, within the next future uh, we will see microprocessors which run much faster actually than they are running right at the moment. I mean there is some uh, interesting research done of course in this area um, because we could think of other materials. One of these uh, we see here, these are so called carbon nanotubes. Uh, some of you still remember in the 80s actually the so-called buckyballs or fullerens. These are one atomic layer uh, carbon structures and uh, you can use these structures actually to build so-called tubes also. And uh, the, these tubes have an extremely um, good characteristic in terms of um, conductance and uh, you can replace the gate oxide metal uh, uh, material which we just discussed through, through so-called carbon nanotubes and with these carbon nanotubes you theoretically actually can scale up to 10 gigahertz uh, which is a good thing. Right at the moment we can structures, uh, we can build structures in the range of some 100 million of such transistors but if you remember right before I said uh, with uh, 7 nanometer technology we are at 8 billion transistors right at the moment on a chip and of course this is quite a good, different number than several hundred million and uh, even so this is a very interesting approach right at the moment uh, it's not possible yet to build bigger chips in a profitable way actually with this material. Nevertheless I think for some applications where uh, ultra high frequencies are needed this could be kind of uh, 
interesting approaches, uh, not replacing the bigger semiconductor uh, microprocessor market, but for special uh, purposes, this uh, could be an alternative. Okay, so I think uh, now we learned Moore's Law, still a little bit of life. Leonard's law, more or less dead actually. Uh, what about Amdahl? So Amdahl is a little bit difficult uh, to show a picture, but uh, I think the problem behind Amdahl just is um, we got parallelization meanwhile in all areas, be it in the base technology. Um, you can imagine uh, having something like 8 billion transistors on a chip uh, doing the wiring, and here we see a kind of wire stack actually with a uh, quite a number of uh, metal layers uh, sitting on the bulk. Um, the wiring is relatively difficult. This means the infrastructure on the chip, uh, the complete I.O. between registers, caches and so on is getting more and more difficult as you get more logic. Um, then of course you have seen all these multi-core um, implementations meanwhile. So we go towards 12 cores. I mean uh, some special smaller cores are in the range of 24. We have also many core chips which then have very um, uh, small cores actually connected, but the, the big um, challenge there is really to keep them efficient, because uh, the more uh, cores you run in parallel, uh, the more crosstalk actually you have between the chips, the more cross information you have to exchange in order to do the handling, all that. And then on top of that, within the core and within the units, you also do parallelization. This means besides uh, Multi-core, you have uh, uh, simultaneous multi-threading. This means you have to put a, a, a structure over the core itself so that you can run several threads in parallel. And we clearly see that for some of these workloads, it's possible to leverage that, but some of the workloads run best in single thread mode. That's uh, just a given. So we have a very high workload dependency there. Then we have parallelization, of course, uh, on an architectural level. We do out of all processing for a long time. Um, we introduced that pretty much beginning of the of this uh, century, uh, and uh, we have, for example, vectorization like SIMD engines, single instruction multi data, and all this parallelization. Of course, um, at, uh, I don't see that we will see a lot of uh, performance gain uh, in the future. And what we have to say in terms of parallelization. Um, of course, the, what our customers are most interested in is single thread performance. This means they have old applications and these uh, applications, of course, only get expedited when you clock up your frequency. And uh, with the parallelization, we, of course, can improve the throughput, yeah, but we cannot uh, improve the single thread, which is a kind of challenge also. Okay? Nevertheless, throughput performance is better than no performance, of course, but um, uh, I don't see actually that we will um, pretty much see a lot of new architectural features in that area right at the moment. Um, besides some things we will discuss then later on in uh, regard to brain-inspired computing, artificial intelligence, all these things, because there we got another level of uh, parallelization, uh, but this is partially uh, out. Uh, due to the uh, matrix multiplication, uh, which we can do there, and this allows um, other precision levels, and so there I think uh, parallelization is another subject. Okay, but so for the state of the art microprocessor today, I don't see a lot of architectural uh, capabilities at the horizon which we still could implement. Just uh, maybe we could build some more cores. But as they got their, themselves in the, into the way, it's, it's not that the, the best way to only stay on that track. Okay? So that's pretty much what happened throughout the last 60 to 70 years. I think a uh, big success, of course, for us as, as a company, this was our business, this is our business. But the question, of course, is what is happening in the future. And uh, what we see is, uh, of course, um, as we have done a lot with the digital, uh, we, yeah, we got into the situation we want to use digital all for also for applications which are a little bit closer to what we do as a human being okay and so for that reason uh, to give you an example what this is for example I want to use you as a human being actually and ask and those who had been in the hits presentation and close to the main station they already know what this is but they, those who have not seen that question to you actually what do you see here
don't be shy. Usually wrong answers help to get to the right answer. Yeah, it looks like that, but it isn't it. <laughs> yes. But it could be, yes, of course. Yeah. No, it's no X-ray, actually it's a normal photography. A hand? Where is it? This is this a hand? Okay, yes, we will clarify that later. It's no hand. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so most, most of the times actually uh, people cannot find out. It's also a little bit depending on the room because if you have a deeper room which is a little bit more narrow, uh, the, the people in the rear uh, obviously have an easier thing uh, to find it out. It's a cow, okay? I show you and you will see pretty much this is an eye, there is an ear, there is an ear and there is the nose. This is your hand actually, but it's not a hand really, okay? And this is the side of the cow. You see it? Everyone sees it? I mean, it's not the most natural way to make a picture of a cow. You don't see it yet? Look, there is an eye. This is an eye, nose, ear, other ear. Here should, could be a horn or something like that. And this is the side of the cow. Yes, yes, that's the normal. No? This, is the, this is why we do this exercise. So you see, it's not very simple to find that out. Huh? Even so, the gain we have is not very dramatically. I mean, we just find out that it's a cow. Okay? And what we also see, um, we have a lot of data, actually, which don't have a very high precision. It's just black and white. Huh? But an, a really big number of pixels. And the only thing you can filter out of it is um, cow. It's not too much. Okay? This is what is very typical for the new applications we see right at the moment. Okay? Artificial intelligence is much about big data, but the density of the data is not always that big. Okay? So we see a dramatic change uh, in uh, the workloads, and we also see there are new questions, actually, uh, which we want to solve with digital methods. Okay? And now what we did in the last two minutes, uh, for almost all of you, actually for those who could see that this is a cow, okay, we drained your brain, actually. We trained your brain so that now this is connected to the term cow, okay. When I go back and I go forth again, you will immediately see the cow. It's almost not doable not to see it, okay. This is how our human brain works, okay. Oh, this is how neural networks work, actually. So for, the, for that reason, what we usually do is we don't use a straightforward algorithms to calculate if this is a cow. I mean, we could invent the algorithm which is counting the black and white dots. Then we could train if the ratio between black and white is X, this is a cow. But you can imagine, I mean, there could be a lot of ratios black and white in this way, and it shouldn't, it's not a cow, okay? So, and to be quite frank, I don't know, maybe one of you can, we cannot really explain why this is a cow, okay? This is something we learned over our life, that this is a cow, okay? Just by recognition, because this is how our human brain... Just explain. Expe excuse me? Just yes, exactly. This is why you learned. Yeah. If I wouldn't explain, you wouldn't learn. I mean, that's how it works, okay? And while I explain, you train your brain. Huh? And how it works in a, a relatively simple way, in a very short way it's we have a kind of input layer and a uh, pattern the pattern is generated when you scan over this picture and then you toggle that through your network actually and then you do a decision on the output layer and on a very high abstraction layer you decide okay this is a cow okay another picture could be this is a dog okay i don't have a dog now but this is how it works you train it Actually, what you train is, you change the weights, this means the conductance between these neurons. And this is the only thing you can modify in a very simple way. Okay, now, human brain works a little bit more complicated, we will look at that later. But on a simple way, this is how it works. Okay? And now, of course, uh, we see, actually, um, this is a very simple neural net. The expectation to neural nets is that they can that they can pretty much recognize much more things, okay, as our human brain can.
Our human brain, of course, is not such a simple structure. It's made out of, uh, oh, this is not very good to see, nevertheless. It's made out of neurons, actually, and then you have tons of synapses and dendrites and all that. And uh, you have, uh, yes, and I have to stay here, actually. This is what I don't learned at the beginning. Um, and uh, you have signals pretty much moving forward and backward. Okay? As a first assumption, this is good enough for us. Now, with this, we see um, information technology is not only about numerical processing, it's about information processing. It's about information, actually, uh, which we want to uh, filter out of a certain structure. Okay? And this is also what's in these workloads, uh, which we see are getting more popular. And the question, of course, is, is the hardware we have the best hardware to solve this kind of problems from an energy perspective or uh, also from a um, perspective how many different categories, for example, we can distinguish. Okay? Now, when we take that as an assumption point for information um, processing, we see that information processing can also be uh, regarded from a little bit less numerical layer. Okay? This is what Shannon did. And I want to demonstrate that with our neural net on this very high abstraction layer uh, without going into the other de uh, implementation details which I shall show later on. What we do is we have a neural net and um, we distinguish um, out of a set of n images which we use to train kind of uh, k categories. Okay, that's what's happening with this neural network which we just have seen. Okay, that's relatively simple. But this is more or less the base assumption which is done in information theory uh, because we can look that uh, from another angle when we uh, try to find a numerical measure actually which we can use in order to uh, understand how much information is in there. And uh, empirically already, and in, uh, more or less uh, without uh, too much thinking, is of course a neural net which can do this categorization uh, in a sophisticated way and in an exact way and with a high number of categories, of course, is a better net or a more powerful net actually than a smaller net which has only fewer categories. That's relatively simple, okay? If I have a net, which can distinguish 10,000 different types of animals in certain flavors. This is more um, challenging, actually, than when I have a net which is just distinguishing between cat and cow. Well, that's relatively clear. So, when we look at that from an information theory perspective, um, Shannon uh, has more or less quantified this circumstance which I just mentioned, okay? And uh, it's relatively simple. This is an, uh, pretty much an expression you know from physics. I guess most of you are physicists. Uh, I'm right? Not? Okay. Okay, I didn't know. Okay. But, so, the physics, physicists, they have an expression which they don't like much, very much, okay? It's called entropy. Okay, everyone loves energy and power because this is very uh, uh, good to understand and it's uh, something you can more or less uh, uh, experience in your daily life when you drive a car or a bicycle or whatever, but entropy is a little bit a strange thing, okay? Entropy is used in thermodynamics and entropy in a certain sense is a stochastic measurement um, which describes chaos, which describes uncertainty, okay? Now, when you hear that, it's a little bit difficult uh, to get a real understanding, but in, in, a, in a certain way, it's not that complicated because what entropy says is if you, if you have an ensemble of things, okay, and uh, this ensemble of things could be these K categories of images which we uh, try to distinguish, okay, and you have to guess uh, with a certain picture, like the cow, what this really is, then the probability that you are right uh, is getting more and more difficult if all the images are equally distributed. Because then the probability for a certain image is each, for each category is the same. Okay? We can do it very simple. If I have um, three images, let's say dog, bird, and cat, and I have a set of n images, 100,000, and they only pretty much show these three images, then if the probability distribution shows that 90% of these images are cats 
and the rest of the 10% are on DOC and the other one I just forgot, doesn't matter, then of course it's easiest to guess that this is a cat because the probability is highest. It's very simple, okay? Now when you take that to bigger numbers, actually this uh, entropy is a very good measurement to describe this uncertainty I just uh, tried to uh, explain a little bit in a more or less numeric way, okay? And the entropy of a probabilistic distribution is at a max when we have equal distribution, so this means each probability is 1 through k, uh, this means equal distributed, and it is zero when I know for sure the probability for one certain category is 1, which is clear. If there are only cats in the ensemble, it's easy to guess, okay? And then your entropy is zero. This means your entropy is a clear measure of your uncertainty, okay? This is what's happening actually in this neural net also. Because we know when we train what category it is. We know it's a cow, okay? But the machine doesn't know. It could be something different. Now if the machine gets the task I just asked you to do, to recognize what's in the image, if the machine has to do recognition, uh, image recognition, then of course the task for the machine is more complicated if it's confronted with a set of images which are equally distributed. And the task at hand is to change this equally distributed uh, uh, distribution into a delta distribution. Because the delta distribution means the entropy is zero. This is what the neural net is doing. It tries to train itself in that way that it for sure can say, okay, look, this image belongs to a certain category. Okay? This is what we can pretty much pull out of information theory. And what we also see when I go back, of course, the max entropy we got here is, getting, is growing with K. Okay? The more images or the more categories of images I can distinguish, the more entropy I get. Relatively clear. It's not that... Uh, okay, but on the other side, this also means um, the entropy describes the maximum amount of information you can have within a system. This means when you have a system, actually, which can... Um, produce a high amount of entropy, then you have a system actually which uh, can do calculations for extremely complex scenarios. Is the minus sign a convention? Yes, it's a convention actually. It's all a convention. Is there is no there is no physical uh, like with uh, power or uh, energy or something. That it's it's a it's a stochastical mathematical definition. Okay? And Shannon's idea was this to translate that from thermodynamics into information theory. Why this is important we will see later on when we talk about quantum computing. Okay? Because the power, the quantum computing is extremely powerful because in quantum computing I can use a relatively small number of qubits and produce an extremely high amount of entropy. It's not the Shannon entropy, it's the von Neumann entropy, but this is exactly the background why this quantum supremacy idea exists. Okay? Now, uh, but quantum is, is the last third part, actually. Now, uh, what we have learned is, uh, with this simple example, this is pretty much an abstraction layer where we can deal with information on an abstraction, actually, which is independent of what Leibniz did with binary and all that. This means from that perspective, information processing means we have a system uh, which uh, is uh, pretty much characterized by a relatively high entropy and we have a system which can resolve this entropy most probably towards zero. Okay? Because this is also interesting when we look at this part. If it's not going to zero, if the entropy is not zero, we cannot be sure what this image is. Okay? Some guys thought this is a hand they are in this part. Most thought this is a cow, okay? The net, the quality of the neural net is the better, the better it can delta shape this function after the pattern ran through that. Okay? 
which is also important for quantum computing because to today we talk about uh, noisy state intermediate quantum computing. Okay? This is where we are here. You can do very good estimates which other systems can do. When we talk about Feynman full-blown quantum computing, we talk about that. Okay? We can pretty much build a Boolean space which allows us to do this, for example, for the Shore algorithm, which we can't do for uh, in higher scales actually uh, with conventional uh, uh, computers. Okay? Now, um, before we go closer into quantum computing, may I uh, ask about the time? Still 50 minutes, okay? So we have to get even faster. Okay, so now when we talk about this, actually, of course the question is what we saw before. We talked about Under, we talked about Dennard, and we did uh, pretty much uh, retrospective on numerical computing. The question is, with our recognition example, is if numerical computing is the best approach to solve problems like that, as they are usually solved by neural nets. And what we see is, well, okay, um, this necessarily uh, has not to be the best solution because I don't think that our brain is doing matrix multiplication. And matrix multiplication is more or less the essence of a neural net. Okay? It's much more an uh, uh, analog way how we learn that. Okay? So the first thing we can do is we could think of can we build matrix multiplication in a more analog way which is closer to what we think is happening in the, sp in the brain structure. And the answer is yes, of course, this is something which we try right at the moment. You can use new materials, um, which we know more from the storage devices, so-called phase change uh, materials. And the phase change materials um, pretty much have a characteristic. You can treat them with a kind of signal, and the signal uh, pretty much can vary your resistance. Okay, so you can uh, vary it from, from zero to one, uh, or with a certain signal you can also have any value in between. I mean, it's not that fine granular that you can have really every value, but you have a certain set of values. Okay? And this set of values, of course, in a certain sense, uh, are similar to what we see on the weight functions of a neural net. Okay? Now, what we do is we build a mesh of phase change material, and in this mesh, we can use phase change materials as resistors, which go from the line base to the column base. Okay? And when we do a matrix multiplication now, we can do that in an analog way, not numerically, where we do arithmetic operations. Now we put a voltage pattern, actually, to these lines, and then we measure the columns. And the voltage, actually, or the current we got there, which we can transform into a voltage then, this is the multiplication of this vector times the vector which is in the column. And as usually neural nets don't use, need an extremely high precision, it doesn't need a floating point 46 bit, a 64 bit implementation, the precision you get there, even so there is some uh, analog uh, shift in there, is good enough for a matrix multiplication used in neural nets. And the big advantage, of course, is it's uh, consuming much less uh, energy, like a GPU does. Uh, it's much faster. Huh? So there are a lot of advantages, and you are much closer to the human brain structure. We have the first prototype chips now in place. Huh? Of course, uh, it's not quite that simple. You need a programming model, uh, which you use from the training model from a normal neural net. Huh? Also, uh, this treating these uh, phase change materials between 0 and 1 is relatively simple, but getting a value in between is not that simple. Okay? Specifically, when it's uh, more in there between. Huh? So there are quite some challenges, but you see in the long run, doing all these algorithms, which we know from artificial intelligence, always with this numerical method, as we know from von Neumann architecture, not necessarily has to be the right thing to do. Okay? We can maybe use other, other devices like this. Of course now, you still have a, a digital chip around that in order to, to fill in this uh, voltage patterns and all that, it's not that simple, but from a concept perspective, you see this is much closer to what our brain is doing, okay? And we can go even uh, one step beyond that, and now the brain structure actually is looking like that, and all the, informa all the information which is flipping uh, 
between all these cells and so you see it's it's a, a massively big network but a uh, big difference also is they don't talk, talk through bits okay they talk through so-called spikes this means neurons they pretty much they don't do anything like a morse alphabet huh? they have more like a language they have certain tones like birds okay this means a neuron can send a spike to another neuron and the spike is a certain melody or a certain signal form okay and there are more than 100 spike forms actually which are known which are used by the human brain okay now going back to our information theory this means while in this Leibniz notation we really turn back the information to the lowest level so that we distinguish between zero and one this is more or less an entropy which you cannot go under okay if you have a probability uh, distribution of just two states there is nothing beyond that because if you just have zero you cannot distinguish anything okay but the brain is a little bit more sophisticated it's not using just zero and one it's using more information actually in its communication to the other urine and the question of course is if you could leverage that in a technology also and this is uh, something uh, which is uh, pretty much realized in this neuromorphic chips neuromorphic chips are a kind of mix of digital and analog and uh, these kind of spikes are kind of encoded bits and they are used to communicate between kind of neurons the big advantage is you don't have to clock your complete net like you do with a microprocessor uh, but you can just pretty much talk from one neuron to the other give him this information and this means he doesn't have to go into all directions he just has to go into the directions which are relevant for example this is what our human brain is also doing and for that reason why this brain is doing that the brain is consuming relatively small amounts of power it's in the some 20 30 watts range or something like that I mean a real sharp thinker may consume 40 watts I don't know Einstein 50 I don't know what, what the right number is but compared to what a microprocessor is consuming and what a microprocessor actually can do in regards to neural nets uh, it's a relatively bad energy efficiency with a with chips actually neuromorphic chips which have been implemented in that way we get a power consumption improvement in the range of a thousand which is very interesting for example for edge devices now also with this case even so it's very interesting it's not quite that simple since uh, the brain structure is not uh, that good understood that the chip is always doing uh, actually what it should do and the other big problem here is of course the programming model because you still have to train the structure the programming model is extremely complex and right at the moment you run the programming through a supercomputer which is consuming much more power than a normal computer for example okay nevertheless this is something uh, uh, where a lot of research is done you know that under neuromorphic computing that's the background okay so what we see is we have the traditional von Neumann now we have more brain inspired neuron synapse oriented computing but we still do information processing okay in the sense that we can use such structures to get from a high entropy state into a zero entropy state huh? in this case zero entropy is a little bit difficult because this is closer to what we are human do beings are doing so I wouldn't say that we go to zero very often because there is always a little bit doubt which means the entropy is not complete down to zero okay so now let's let talk a little bit about quantum computing with the same thing in mind as we just discussed in one case we have Leibniz we have Boole and we have De Morgan and we build uh, field effect transistors in a big amount we clock them actually and we can calculate on this binary math it works very fine okay so we have both we have the theoretical background and we have the devices actually which can do that in a good fit and in a in a good manner hmm? now of course we could think of our other devices and this is exactly what qubits are okay now qubits are 
theoretically very good understood because we have quantum theory, we have quantum mechanics, okay? We know actually how these things work. And um, we also know that they have some special characteristics, okay? When we combine them, actually they can do th strange things actually which you don't know from, from classical entities. They do superposition actually, which is strange because this means they are not in a real defined state, they are in a state in between as long as we don't measure them. Okay, they are somewhere between a zero and a one state. As long as we don't care, actually it can stay in this state, which is very interesting because you don't have to bring it into a defined state and then put it into another defined state. You can leave it in an undefined state while you do some manipulation on it. Okay? The final thing is only when you measure it, then it's different. Okay? And then uh, a much more interesting thing is with uh, qubits or quantum states, you can entangle these things, okay? which is also something which we don't know from classics. And entanglement brings a very interesting um, property, actually. This means when we do entanglement and we want to describe it, the phase room is not a Cartesian product, it's a tensor product. Okay? And the tensor product, of course, is exploding in a certain sense in size. And now when you go and superpone actually entangled states, then you have a very high number of different states and a, high, a very high number of different states of course means you could distinguish a very high number of different categories. You just have to bring the link from these categories we talked about before to these um, um, states which you can produce with a relatively small amount of qubits. And with this relatively small amount of qubits, you can build an extremely high amount of uh, entropy. Which means you can pretty much um, represent a very high number of informa information. A much higher number of information than you can do with bits, with classical bits. Okay? Now, the other part of that is, of course, as uh, you know from quantum, quantum theory, uh, to treat these uh, qubits is not quite as simple actually as we can do with bits. Because there are some laws in quantum mechanics um, which uh, are special and uh, this means when you want to do logical operators they have to be reversible. You have to have reversibility actually uh, when you try to apply logical gates to qubits. Okay? Now, Reversibility doesn't work for some of the Boolean operations which we have seen before. Huh? Not works, okay, but OR and AND doesn't work. So what you have to do, similarly to what we did with traditional computing, you have to find a new logic, actually, besides the Boolean logic, and this is what Feynman did, uh, which allows you to build a complete set of Boolean terms, and at the same time is reversible. Okay? And you can do that. Uh, to be quite frankly, I also not really completely understood how this works, but it's relatively simple. So you have just three basic operations which are not, controlled not. So this means you take care if this is a not or not a not, uh, depending on the state of the control gate. And you do controlled, controlled not. I mean, at that point, actually, I had to stop with reading because it's getting really kind of strange. Nevertheless, Good mathematic guys actually can prove that with these three basic functions you can build a complete set of Boolean terms. Which means the same actually as you have right at the moment with a von Neumann architecture, you can use these terms actually in order to do quantum computing and more or less theoretically build any algorithm with a quantum computer. Okay? And the reason why you cannot do it in this more simple way that we are used is reversibility. Now, what von Neumann did, this is John von Neumann who also uh, defined the von Neumann architecture, he could show that you can also build a von Neumann entropy actually which is based on the density matrix of quantum states. This is what he defined here. And the, the, uh, then actually with this, uh, you can show that the Shannon entropy and this entropy are comparable. 
This is exactly what we try to show here in this presentation. This now means you can produce an extremely high volume of entropy. You have a Boolean set actually uh, of uh, quantum gates, like not controlled not, and this means you can use these gates actually to manipulate your quantum states, your qubits, and you can do normal math. That's how it works. With the, with the interesting part that this, this amount of von Neumann entropy you could, can produce with a relatively small number of qubits actually brings this quantum supremacy. This is something you couldn't handle with a classical implementation. Okay? This would be great because now we have a kind of closed theory which is comparable to Leibniz, Boolean, and De Morgan. Okay, we have a head of uh, so to say we have a, a algebra actually, and we have a notation, and this works all together. And we have the same thing here. Now the problem, of course, is in the case of Boolean or of uh, binary notation. We had these field effect transistors which scale and which we can clock and which are a perfect representation of a zero and one state. This means what we need now, we need devices actually which can represent these qubits. That's the important part actually. Otherwise, this is a theory, but you cannot do that practically. Okay? And this is the big challenge. Now, within the last few years we got some of these implementations. Okay? What we are doing is what we see here. Um, these are so-called transmons, uh, which are implemented actually on a chip. Uh, just show the chip here. This chip is like this size. It's superconducting actually. And um, when you go a little bit further down, then uh, within these, these small areas here, you have microwave wires actually. And in these in this small areas, you have a structure like this, which is called transmon. So just have a junction which you cool down to 17 millikelvin, which is pretty cold. And then you can pretty much um, fire in a kind of microwave. And uh, this microwave uh, means that in a kind of uh, unharmonic oscillator, you got this qubit uh, realized in the form that you have power uh, oscillating in that area. Okay? This really shows quantum behavior. This is important. Qubits. If you want to realize qubits, you have to get to structures which show quantum behavior. Okay? Right at the moment, I think there are two streams. Um, one is this part, actually, where people do a lot in matter. This means uh, superconducting um, structures, not always that low down at 17 millikelvin. The bad thing about they, uh, the things which they do higher up, they don't really work in a good way, um, but uh, time will tell. And then the other path which is uh, done are photons. Uh, photons actually which are run through uh, waveguides. Uh, now with these waveguides the programmability actually which is the application of this logic gates we I showed before, this quantum gates is a little bit difficult. But we will see. Three minutes? Okay. So this means you can realize qubits today. Actually what you have seen on this chip here we have five qubits. Okay. State of the art today is we have something, we have chips which are in the range of 50 qubits. Okay? Now really to get to quantum supremacy I think you would need hundreds to thousands to hundred thousand qubits. Huh? So we are far away from that. Huh? And uh, it's not only the number of qubits, besides that, this was bad actually, but this is good. Um, besides that, what you also uh, need uh, in order to run them in a, in a uh, reasonable way, you have to find a kind of aperture, aperture which allows you to apply these microwave signals in such a way that they represent such quantum gates. This is what, I, what are, is meant here with some of these quantum gates. There are Hadamard operators and so on. Then you do pretty much uh, entanglement. And, and uh, This means you, you shoot microwave signals in there which represent a kind of initialization of the qubits and then you can package a kind of algorithm into these microwave sequences. And the system has to be that stable that while you're doing that actually at the end you still can take a measurement which is not uh, mostly influenced by all the distortion you have in but which is influenced by the 
by the algorithm you want to do. Okay, and this is a big challenge, of course. Um, usually what you do is you pack these chips in such a tube. This tube is more or less my size. This is a picture from the Zurich lab. And uh, within this tube, you cool that down to 17 millikelvin, and then at the tip, actually here, this chip is sitting, and all these wires pretty much go to this microwaves. That's what is done. And then, of course, today there is a kind of GUI, a graphical interface, which allows you to, to write these type of sequences, actually, and this, this kind of sequences of uh, quantum gates uh, on a normal user interface, actually it's called Qiskit. If you are interested in that, it's for free. It's a, it's a uh, web-based or, or um, cloud-based application and everyone who has interest uh, in trying that out and writing some algorithms, uh, you can do that. Okay? You can even run then on this uh, real systems actually. This means you are in a kind of queue and your little application is ejected and then you get your measurement. Okay? So, now the challenge, of course, is uh, what I just said, you have to be stable. Uh, and this means, this is measured in coherence time. Huh? This means how long do these qubits really stay in a shape so that the measurement makes sense. And uh, what we see over, years, over the years now, uh, from 1998, we could use this from a re really very short time, actually, to a more realistic time, somewhere in the millisecond range. Huh? But to get to quantum supremacy, of course, we need much longer times and we need much more qubits. Huh? Okay, that's what it is. Hope uh, you got some new insights. Thank you.